Testament church did it, let me remind you again that each of these things that we're going to discuss are unique characteristics of the New Testament church. And someone says, yeah, but everybody prays. And when we saw that picture, everybody knows what those hands mean. Everybody prays to some God, some uh, someone. But there's something different about the way the New Testament does this, the New Testament church does this. And so that's what we need to be t- paying attention to this morning. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the passage that Stanford read for us so well this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Uh, as, as Stanford told me, that it's a short passage, but there's so much uh, in just these three verses for us to think about. We're not going to think about all of it this morning, but when you put the three together... What does God want for us? What is His will for our existence here on earth? He sums it up in these three verses. At the end of of verse 18, He says, This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What's the will of God? Go back to verse 16. His will is that you rejoice always, that you pray without ceasing, and that you give thanks in all circumstances. That's His will. Uh, Rejoice always. Uh, I've recently picked up this quote from uh, my cousin, she says, uh, happiness is having a piece of cake, right? Nothing makes you more happy than having a piece of cake. Joy is knowing the recipe, right? Happiness is having that piece of cake and, and, and digging into it and just experiencing all the, the emotions and the feelings of, of digging into a piece of cake. <laughs> but joy is the long-lasting and abiding understanding of how that cake came into being how you got to be the blessed person who got to eat that piece of cake. And I hope you're expanding this into the spiritual realm in your minds here. To rejoice always is to understand why you have reason to rejoice. That you always have reason to rejoice because you are blessed by God. You are here on God's time. Give thanks in all circumstances. We will will always have fuel for our gratitude, something to to, uh, power us in terms of our gratitude and our thankfulness to God. It's always there. And then pray without ceasing. How? How can we pray without ceasing? Again, uh, you know, our overly literal minds go, man, it, that would be a, an existence where uh, we're just talking nonstop. How could that possibly? And, and you know, logically, we, we start to dismiss that idea. But do we understand the urgency of our predicament uh, as As sinful people, without God's grace, we'll be lost. We'll be lost in sin eternally. To take full advantage of that grace, we must be in constant communication with the grace giver uh, through prayer and through listening to the word. When we fail to keep God's law, which is sin, he is ready at a moment's notice to forgive us yet again if if we tell him about it. If we tell him what we did, 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to continually forgive us of our sins. So if we don't want to worry about anything, we should pray about everything. That's what we've been learning in Philippians on our study on Wednesday nights, Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. In everything, prayer and petition, bring your requests to God. The peace of of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If you want to not have to worry about anything, then pray about everything. We should be uniquely ready and capable to drop everything at a moment's notice and speak to the Father in time of need. Gratitude or on another person's behalf, all those things at a moment's notice. God's people, the people of the church, the the members of the church should be uniquely ready, suited, willing to just stop and pray. I'm I'm more blessed maybe than anybody when I get to go and make visits and talk to people uh, in their homes or in the hospital because they are so ready for a prayer, and it reminds me to be ready for a prayer. They want to they pray. They want to hear someone talking to God and, and expressing their, their needs and their desires. 1 John chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. 1 John chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. John says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He has commanded us. When when prayer becomes all about getting what I want, it is robbed of its real power, right? Prayer can reassure us when nothing else will. When when does my heart condemn me? This passage kind of hints at this. 
when, when I know I'm doing wrong, when my conscience is bothering me, that's when my heart is condemning me. It's saying, you're doing wrong. And God only, already knows my heart and he knows everything else. But when I know, you know, when do I know that I'm, what I'm doing is right? Well, that's when I'm living righteously. I'm practicing righteousness. And then in those moments, the qualification here is that I can ask God confidently and be assured of a positive outcome. I can request and, and know that I can receive that because I'm pleasing God. I'm keeping His commandments. If I'm keeping God's commandments and I'm pleasing Him, my motives are pure. And I will be asking for what's best for God and His people, not for my personal gain. When I put God and, and, and the church's interests first, there's not, not much that I need to ask for, actually. James chapter 4, this is going to sound kind of similar to what we just read. James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. James 4, actually I'll start, start in verse 1. He says, What causes 